Oh yeah, that's that's a look. Okay. Man, the things I put in the internet. Hi everyone, Kate here, and this week I'm going to be scrolling back through about two years of projects and tutorials that I've done on my channel. For each one, I'm going to be giving a little mini review talking about how perhaps the beauty recipe performed long term. If I still liked it after several months, I do test everything, but sometimes your opinion changes between, you know, using something for a week versus using something for months and months or not using it, as the case may be. If you see me looking down, it's just because I have my laptop in front of me and I'm going to be going through in, I think I'm going to go through them in chronological order and then reorder the clips later in editing by category, because I feel like that would make for a more, more useful video if, say, all the cold creams are grouped together, all the food recipes are grouped together, etc., in case you're only interested in, in one category. Uh, but yeah, if I'm looking down, that's why. It's because my laptop is, is right here and I not going to remember all these off the top of my head, so I have to, I have to reference. Okay, so the most recent cold cream I made was a 1924 Pine Woods cold cream. This was a Christmas gift for my mother. I did keep a small jar for myself, which I've been, been using, and then the rest went to her as a Christmas gift. I can't remember what base I used. I used the same base as I used for another recipe, and maybe when I get to it, I'll remember. And then I used a 1924 scent blend to give it the pine wood smell. My mother absolutely adored this one. She really, really likes it. She like she might have used it all by now. She either has used it all or is pretty close to finishing the jar already. Like I just gave it to her for Christmas, but she really liked it. The smell, very woodsy, piney, but the little bit of lavender in it, it was, I think it was lavender essential oil gives it a slight sweetness. I think if it was just pine oil by itself, it wouldn't have been quite as nice, but with the little addition of the lavender, it just gives a nice undertone to the scent. She's really, really been enjoying it. I think she said it was her her favorite cold cream that I've ever made her, mostly because of the scent. Not necessarily the, the base. Is, I mean, it's good. It's fine. It's a perfectly acceptable cold cream, but the scent is really what sets this one apart. Oh, 1924 Floral Cold Cream. Lang Lang Bergamot Vanilla Neroli Rose. Oh, oh, this was the one <laughs> that I used for the Pine Woods Cold Cream base recipe. It was the same one as the 1924 Floral Cold Cream. Really like this recipe. I really, really like this one. I actually still have a little bit. I didn't give all of this one away. I like the scent so much I kept most of it for myself, which is unusual. My only criticism with this one is that this particular cold cream base is a little more prone to splitting than most of my cold cream recipes. Not to the point that it wasn't usable. It's very minor. It's just more than most of the other recipes I make. But I did really, really like this one. It was a very, it was a very interesting scent blend. It definitely one of the favorite ones that I made in the last little while. As I said, still have it, still use it, still love it. Okay, Bergamot Rose 1920s Pearly Cold Cream. Yeah, I do make a lot of cold creams. They do well, like the videos do well, and th they are very much appreciated for gifts, which is why I make as many as I do. <laughs> I think I really like this one. I have, m we're, we're getting back to over a year ago now, so my memory's getting, a oh, oh, I know. I have, when I was gonna film this video before 10 months ago, <laughs> I wrote out notes. I should refer to my notes. My notes say, this is the current one. <laughs> Smells lovely, really like it. <laughs> so there there you have it, folks. Smells lovely, really like it. <laughs> Actually, the next one on my list is also cold cream. Cucumber cold cream. My notes said, I was a bit meh about it. It's quite thick. One of my mom's faves. Yes, that's what I remember with this one. I think she actually just finished it. I gave her a huge jar. <laughs> She loved it. She said it was her favorite cold cream of all time. I don't know if that's now been replaced by the pine cold cream. I should ask her about that. But at the time, this was her favorite cold cream that I'd ever made, this cucumber 1930s recipe. I've had a few people comment that they really, really like this recipe. I think it's one of those things you either really like it and it really, really works for your skin, or it's just too much. And for my skin, it was too much. And for my mom's skin, it was perfect. So she has older, drier skin. I'm younger, and as I said, I'm not oily, but I'm, I don't need a lot of extra moisture, so too much for me, perfect for her. 
Oh, Witch Hazel Vanishing Cream. This was a 1922 recipe. Vanishing creams are really interesting. They're different than a cold cream. There is saponification going on that allows the cream to be emulsified. They're very shelf stable. I didn't have any separation issues with the vanishing cream. She really liked it as a day cream, you know, to wear going out when you don't want something super, super heavy on your skin. And I really liked it just as an all round general cream. So I've made vanishing creams before, but out of the ones that I've made, that one is my favorite. Oh yeah, my notes say, one of my favorite products of all time, light but effective, and makes the skin look better, almost like a blurring primer. Yes, that's, that's what it is, blurring primer. Like, it's not a foundation or anything, there's no pigment there, but somehow when you put it on, it just, like, erased your pores. I love that stuff, and I'm, I have, like, a little tiny, tiny bit in the jar that I'm, like, saving for a special occasion, but I definitely have to make a, another vanishing cream of a very similar nature, because that one was absolutely fabulous. Uh, we have a lanolin cream from the 1920s. It says, long gone, but had requests from my mother for more. I remember liking the smell on this one. Yeah, I, this was a pretty rich hand cream. Anything with lanolin is typically very moisturizing. I think I quite liked it. Other than that, I, I can't really tell you. If she asked for more, it was probably very moisturizing and she liked it. So the oat lotion, that was actually more like a face mask rather than a what we think of as a lotion. It was basically something you applied to your face, let it sit for a while, and then rinsed off. Yeah, I mean, it was okay. I mean, you know, it didn't didn't make me look 20 years younger and five pounds thinner, but it was all right. And then we did the, oh, the rose water sheet mask. That was basically just rose water, but I cut my own sheet mask, which was slightly terrifying looking. <laughs> It was really simple and my skin likes rose water. So it, it certainly didn't do any harm. Again, no miracles performed, but eh, it was okay. This was a 1900 lotion. Yeah, I don't really remember this one. I definitely used it. I only made a small bottle. Sometimes with glycerin, they can be a little sticky. I think this one wasn't sticky, which is quite unusual. Most times with glycerin recipes, they have kind of a weird texture. They're not not my favorite in terms of texture. I've made a few glycerin cold creams that have just never made it to the channel for that exact reason. They've just had a weird texture. But I think I remember actually quite liking that one. Maybe in the summer I might actually remake that because it was it was really simple. I don't think I'd bother with the color. Again, the color was just to make it look pretty. <laughs> but glycerin and rose water is a pretty standard historical beauty concoction meant to help your skin stay soft. A glycerin helps draw moisture towards the skin as long as you get it in the right quantities. If you just apply glycerin, depending on the humidity of the air, it can actually draw the moisture out of your skin. So it's one you just have to be aware of that. Uh, and then what did I do? Slather honey on my face? The honey treatment, 1932. Yeah, it's just honey. I do this all the time. Uh, I've had some commenters saying they really like honey for removing makeup. I don't find with the kind of makeup that I use that really works, but it's really good for skin issues. I have a lot of trouble with, with acne and stuff. Even though I'm getting old, I'm getting wrinkles and acne. That's fun. <laughs> but it, it works really well. It's very, uh, it helps even out skin tone. Again, helps with acne. Highly recommend honey for the face. That's something I do do regularly, still do all the time. I keep a little jar on my counter. Winner. <laughs> okay, so I talked in a video about quickly made sewing and knitting patterns in the 20s and 30s. I'm not gonna discuss this here because that was not a tutorial per se. It was more just a list of some of my favorites that I had made previously. Uh, but if you're interested in fast to make garments, definitely check that one out. Oh yeah. Next up, we have the 1895 botanical glue recipe and Victorian fern art. I, I was kind of sad this video didn't do better because I would love to do more historical crafts on my channel. I love the final result. It's hanging just out of frame here. Uh, the only things I wish I had done differently is I wish I had used a little bit more glue. I think I was thinking, it, oh, it'd be fun if it was a little three-dimensional. But over time, the bits where I didn't apply glue have curved quite a bit more than I was expecting. I think it's because it's right above a heat vent where I have it hanging. So the, the extra heat has 
definitely curled the ferns more than I would have liked. Where where I put enough glue and where I put the glue, it hasn't shifted at all. The only other thing is that it's definitely faded a bit, but that happens with any botanicals. They always look really pretty when you first press them, and then over time, especially with exposure to sunlight, the pigments fade and they get kind of a little on the brown side. It's still green, but it's not as green green as it was. So first, sewing make. This was over a year ago. I don't do a lot of sewing content on my channel, but this was a 1920s bathing costume made in four hours. That was part of the vintage pool party make-along. I guess it was make-along. I don't quite remember. Yeah, I really like this one. I've definitely worn the bathing suit a few times, not as a bathing suit. I typically wear it more as like a spring play suit. It's a good frolicking outfit. <laughs> Okay, so the most recent makeup recipe was my autumnal Edwardian leaf rouge. This is the sort of recipe that I really enjoy making. It has kind of a fun novelty value, but I never use them. They just sit on my shelf because I am too lazy to use stuff like this. Anything that requires more than just like putting a brush in or dunking my finger in and putting it on my face, nine times out of ten I'm going to be too lazy to use it. <laughs> And that's the thing with the awarding leaf rouges. You got to get the sponge and you got to get the sponge wet and you got to dab it on your face. I'm not going to be doing that on a daily basis. So they sit in a nice little box with all my makeup and they look pretty and I never touch them. Okay, I was so excited about the cake mascara. It took me years to figure out how to make cake mascara. I actually quite liked it as a mascara. I haven't used it too much just because I don't typically wear a lot of mascara. I have quite quite naturally, naturally full and long eyelashes. What a problem. <laughs> but I find when I put mascara on, it sort of, I don't know, it makes my eyelashes too heavy and I find it uncomfortable. But it was good. It was a perfectly usable cake mascara. I'm not sure if one or two people had problems with the recipe. I know with something like that, it's a lot harder to get it exact because the measurements have to be much more precise. So if you're perhaps using a scale that doesn't go to as fine a decimal point, that may account for any errors because you, like you're like you making such a small quantity and that's the kind of recipe where the chemical reaction that happens is very important. But all in all, I found it a perfectly suitable cake mascara. I don't know, I, I liked it. I, as I said, I don't use it very often, but I still have it, it's still fine. Okay, and then the eyebrow gel. Um, I made this for the video and then never made any ever again. <laughs> I don't use an eyebrow gel. My, my eyebrows just, they either stay put or they do their own thing and I don't worry about it. And then we had cold cream rouge. Oh yeah, so this was just rouge stirred into cold cream. I actually really like this one. It's, it's better if you're not wearing foundation. Any of these sort of, um, I don't want to say moisture rouges, but I can't think of another word. <laughs> Not dry rouges. <laughs> rouges that have fluid in in them. That's not sounding any better. <laughs> anyway, they tend not to apply the best over top of foundation. This is more of a kind of an everyday rouge because I don't I don't wear foundation every day. So I was applying it on days where perhaps going out, but I'm not doing a full face of makeup, which is like most of the times when I go out. I, I only put full face of makeup for filming anymore. I've gotten really lax with that. <laughs> no, no, it's not lax. It's historical. I'm being historically accurate. Yes, that's it. Oh, speaking of foundation, though, you can actually do the same trick with foundation powder. Like I used red powder to make a rouge but you can do the same thing to make like a foundation. It's it's sort of like a grease paint, if I'm honest. I'm gonna do a future video about that, but you can use the same trick to make yourself a, a foundation. So next on the makeup list, we had a 1924 liquid snow white and powder version. I did a historical liquid powder and then I turned it into like a powder powder. Okay, I don't know what is wrong with me. This is not the first time I've tried a liquid powder. I know I don't like liquid powders, but I want to like liquid powders. <laughs> I want them to work better than they do. They're basically a precursor to modern foundation. It's a powder recipe suspended in some sort of liquid base, usually alcohol based just for preservation purposes. They never look good. <laughs> they look good on, oh, no, I should clarify that. They look good on camera. They do not look good in real life. In real life, they look awful. <laughs> The powdered version that I made afterwards 
it's okay. It's a powder. It's not my favorite powder. It's not the worst powder I've ever made. It's, you know, it's all right. But the liquid powder, no, no. I need to teach myself to stop making liquid powders because I hate them. And I know I hate them, but I just, I can't give up hope. <laughs> I just want to like them so much. Okay, so then the Victorian curling fluid. Now, this is one that I had done in a previous video, like years, years before, but it was so good that I wanted to share again. This one I really like. I don't use this very often, but if I need my curls to stay, like for a special event, or I'm doing, I don't know, like Mary Pickford curls or something where the structure is very important and I don't want the curls to fall, definitely love this curling fluid. It's very simple to make. I just make it up in sort of batches as I need it rather than making up a huge whack because there's no preservative in it and it will go off after a while. The sugar helps a bit. I think not in this video, but in the previous video that I did, I did actually test one with curling fluid and without curling fluid and you could visually see there was a difference between the curls. The curls stay in tighter and they stay in longer. So if you you want some sort of hairstyling product, highly recommend Victorian curling fluid. So the dry shampoo, I don't think this one was my favorite. This one had, was made with corn meal rather than corn starch. It worked, it did make my hair cleaner. My only criticism with this one is that corn meal is much more difficult to brush out of your hair than corn starch. I guess the idea is that you're cleaning your hair and that you want the grossness basically to stick to the cornmeal and then to physically remove the cornmeal. Whereas with cornstarch, it's got such a finer, softer texture that you can, you can really get away with leaving it in your hair. I wasn't super keen on this recipe. As I said, it worked. It made it to the video. If I was to make it again, I would use a cornstarch based recipe, not a cornmeal. Not a fan, not a fan. Oh, the 15 minute raw egg dry shampoo. This was for a 1930s technique. Okay, it promised to be fast. Now, I will admit, I may not have done this right. I did get some criticism that I didn't use a boar bristle brush or like a natural bristled brush. Nah. Natural bristled brush? <laughs> there we go. Yes, I didn't, but my brush is very hard to clean and I didn't want to have to throw out my brush because I permanently had egg in it. I didn't want to have egg in my hairbrush forever. <laughs> so I did use a plastic brush. So I'm sure that limited the amount that I was able to brush out of my hair. It probably would have been better with a natural bristle brush. However, my main criticism of this recipe is not that it didn't brush out, but that it did not take 15 minutes. <laughs> If I'm going to do a recipe that promises to be a quick, easy way to wash my hair, I don't care how effective it is if it's not fast and easy. If it's not fast and easy, I forget, it took like, however, I can't remember how long it took. It took more than 15 minutes anyway. I think it took like an hour or two. If it's not quick and easy, just, just wash your hair. Don't put meringue on it. <laughs> Okay, and then we did tissue paper rag curlers. Not a huge fan of the tissue paper rag curlers. They didn't have, if I remember correctly, I don't think they had the problems that I normally have with rag curlers. So the, the tissue paper rag curls didn't have those same issues, but it did seem a lot of work. I could have probably reused the tissue paper a few times, but I, I didn't. <laughs> they went in the compost. 1822 Imperial Liquid for Strengthening and Preserving the Hair. This was a hair oil scented with alkanet, I think. And no, it's not scented with alkanet. Dyed with alkanet and scented with essential oils. I didn't end up using all of this one. This The oil went rancid before I could use it all. Part of the thing with this one is that because it was such a dark color, I was terrified about staining things. As I said, I use it for my scalp, so I'm applying it fairly liberally. And I was terrified I was going to stain my white towels or my white countertop or something else in my predominantly white bathroom. <laughs> okay, so the 1912 Christmas ice cream, which was like a little Charlie Brown style, like real tree in a pot of ice cream. Very cute, very easy. My only thought with that is that it would be a fair amount of work for something you're like 
you're not going to eat the decoration. The decoration is just sort of for serving purposes. It's really cute, but it, it did seem like a fair amount of work. <laughs> And then we had the 1904 nut gravy. I've made nut gravy for years. Nut gravy has been something I made fairly frequently. It definitely is probably better if you thicken it a bit. The original recipe is not thickened, although it does say, you know, thickened if desired. And I think I did go back and thicken mine. It's a little runny if you make it as is. I I mean, sort of, I guess, if you like runnier, more saucy, saucy gravy. <laughs> saucy. <laughs> You know what I mean, though, right? But the kind of things that I'm serving it on, something thicker is a little better. So definitely add the cornstarch if you're making that recipe. All in all, though, that, that one's really good. I really like nut gravy. And then we also had the 1904 cranberry soup as part of the three Christmas recipes I just made. That one was probably my least favorite of the three. I kind of liked it. I, I didn't really expect to like it, but it was actually kind of good. It was a really interesting texture. I would not use totally pure cranberry juice. <laughs> As I mentioned in the video, I think doing it with like a cranberry cocktail or something that you actually enjoy just drinking straight would be better than what I used. <laughs> Mine was a little strong. <laughs> okay, and then, wow, I actually did more food this year than I expected. I don't know why I did so much food, because my food videos never do well. <laughs> So the Edwardian Witch Apples were a 1913 recipe for Halloween. They were a baked apple with a marshmallow, and I think they had a cherry and sugar on top, and you set the whole thing on fire. <laughs> that was really fun. Those were really good, too. I really enjoyed those. My sort of more autumnal variation was... I I personally found it tastier than the original. I think it was, the original was just a little bland. And some of these historical recipes were just a little on the bland side. I don't know if they would have added more sugar. I'm, I tend to be a little conservative with the sugar, just with my health. Like I shouldn't, shouldn't have too much sugar. So I tend to be a little light on it. But any, anything you set on fire is a good dessert. <laughs> like intentionally. <laughs> intentionally set on fire. <laughs> we have the 1920s cool drinks for the languishing. So these were three non-alcoholic beverages, and I don't remember them at all. There was one that was coffee flavored. Let me check. So yeah, coffee syrup, and then I made two different sparkling iced teas. I made a regular sparkling iced tea, and then I did a non-caffeinated one as well with a flavored fruit tea or something. Okay. Oh yeah, I filmed this one during a heat wave. If, if my hair looks sort of like limp, like normally I curl it for filming, but it was too hot for anything. That was absolutely ridiculous. I was wearing my beach pajamas and still I was absolutely dying when I was filming that one. I really was languishing. <laughs> I definitely didn't bother making the coffee syrup again. It was kind of an interesting concept, but I didn't find it as labor saving as the article sort of promised. It seemed a lot of, a lot of work for what you got. The sparkling iced tea I found quite interesting. That was adding carbonated water to some sort of tea. And they were really good. I haven't bothered to make them again. It was fun. If I was entertaining, I might serve the sparkling iced tea thing. But for an everyday thing, I just can't be bothered. <laughs> it's the 1923 lemon sherbet. And I remember this one because it was delicious. I think in the video that I didn't really give it enough time to freeze before filming because I was just really in a hurry to get done. However, I did actually put the leftovers in the freezer and let it freeze properly. And I was eating it for days afterwards. And it was so good. I'm definitely making that recipe again. A lot of times when I make a historical recipe, it's like, okay, I made it. Never going to make it again. I really, really like that lemon sherbet. Was that Bettina? That was Bettina. That was my girl Bettina. Not from A Thousand Ways to Please a Husband. I think it was from one of her other cookbooks because it says 1923. And I think A Thousand Ways to Please a Husband, which is a cookbook, in case you're not aware, it's really surprisingly charming, despite the name. It is a very cute cookbook. Um, that, I think, is 1917, if I remember correctly. So this is 1923, so it must have been one of the other Bettina books. I can't remember where I got that one from. But it was really good. And I, I have thought about it. <laughs> I have thought longingly about that lemon sherbet. <laughs> oh, oh, next we have oat coffee. <gasps> oh, oat coffee. Oh, and, and the oat muffins. I have made the oat muffins multiple times again. They're really bland on their own. I like them. I had a friend that made them and she was like, these are so bland. These are boring. And I'm like, 
yeah, you need, you need jam with them. You can't eat them plain. They need to have something on them. Uh, for some reason, I've never made oat coffee again. <laughs> I've never made any, what was the other one? I made three different oat beverages as well. I think I made like an oat hot chocolate and an oat, I think it was supposed to be like barley water, like a gluten-free barley water. That one I remember actually not being too bad, but I, no, I didn't make any of the oat beverages again. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, then we, <laughs> then we have Candy Jim. <laughs> Candy Jim. Okay. <laughs> Candy Jim stuck around on the countertop for ages <laughs> because I was too terrified to throw him out. <laughs> I have this thing, when something has a face, I have a hard time throwing it out, uh, and I had to get somebody else to dispose of it. <laughs> he just stared at me every time I tried to get rid of him. <laughs> it's like, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. He's looking at me. <laughs> lavender. What was lavender water? I have no... Oh, was it like a... Um... Oh, it was lavender, rose water, and alcohol. So this was like a a spray, just like a sort of a light perfume. I don't have it anymore, so I must have used it up. I don't know if I used it up like as a body spray. Sometimes with perfumes, if they're not fabulous, I just use them up as like like an air freshener spray. <laughs> I think it was all right. It was it was quite simple. It smelled like lavender with a bit of rose, uh, as you as you might expect. <laughs> and then we had a heliotrope perfume from 1893. So this is bergamot, Benzoin and vanilla. I think I kept this one. I think I really like this one to the point that I kept it as a perfume. If I don't like them enough, they tend to get relegated to room sprays and like bathroom de deodorants. But I think this one I actually did keep as a perfume. I remember really liking it. I, I do like vanilla-y perfumes. Just sort of a sweet, gentle floral. Yeah, not bad. Oh, and another video that did terrible was my 1920s mosquito repellent and chaser video. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that one to do all that well, but I just wanted to try them out anyway. My notes here just said, never use them again as it was the end of season and the oil slash powder ones were so gross. <laughs> I think I did actually use the spray one this summer, and it performed about as well as most essential oil-based bug repellents perform. I remember the oil one being absolutely revolting, though. Did that have, like, castor oil or something in it? It felt really... Blah. That was not nice. I didn't mind the spray, but the other ones were, like... Even if they had worked, I wouldn't have used them, because they were gross. An alcohol-based spray is really the way to go with something like that. Kiss Me Quick Victorian Perfume Recipe. Well, that one actually did pretty well. Usually my perfume recipes do not do well. <laughs> Nobody likes my perfume recipes. I don't really remember this one. My notes say, used it a few times, not my favorite scent, but it's okay. And I do use it occasionally. I think this one is probably one that I've used up as an air freshener because I don't have it anymore. I did a bathroom declutter, uh, I don't know, a few months ago. I put, I, I could check. I posted about it on my, my Patreon account, but... I had a whole pile of perfumes that I decluttered and I put in a pile to use as air fresheners. Pretty sure that one ended up in the air freshener category. So that's something that I like the smell of, but not enough to wear, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> now that we have gone through the last two years, next week I will be moving on to some new recipes and new tutorials. So if you're interested, please stick around. I love making videos and I hope to be doing this again in a year, two years, three years down the road. I mean, not like talking about the same recipe. It's like, you know, an updated version. <laughs> As always, thank you for watching and I will see you guys next time. Bye. This video is made possible through the generous support of my Patreon members. Thank you.